Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our hosted PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full-color, full-featured, full-HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. All right, that's it. VUC 570 for December 4th, 2015, 2015. How to start and run a VoIP business. And I'm reading that on the prompter, but I have something else that I'm going to improvise. Tad Hack Paris. It's a mini Tad Hack. It's one week from tomorrow if you're watching this live. Otherwise, it's one week from December 4th, which, uh, let me see, one week, December 4th, plus nine days. That's December 12th, right, James? Thank you for that. Uh, all right. We're going to get started here with the typical question. We got Vilus, and let me uh, introduce him as soon as I find the camera. There it is. Vilus, you need to unmute, and welcome for your first time on VUC, VoIP Users Conference. Hi, Randy. Okay. Um, what to say about this book? Here's Michael's got something up about it. First book, which explains in plain English how to become a VoIP provider and start different services based on VoIP technology. And what's interesting about this discussion is that it has a certain historical value in that we've got pioneers in the field with us, at least one, Mr. James Bodie. James, uh, repeat what you said earlier about your your shady past. Would you My please? dodgy past. Well, once upon a time, um, I was responsible for running what was, I think, the first public uh, VoIP service in the UK. It was called GossipTel. Right. And you were probably about, I don't know. I was three. What? Yeah, three years old when that was going. Um, yeah, it, it was a hairy, happy, exciting, heady days when everything was new and exciting. But today, these days, um, there seem to be so many people offering VoIP services. It seems to take the, the fun out of it. So we right. also do things like building global mobile network operators and things like that these days to get our kicks. Right, and uh, just to mention some context here, uh, I first saw James's name uh, at the Free World Dial-Up Forum, yeah. and that was the day uh, Jeff Pulver. Uh, that was his thing, by the way, and he sold the Grandstream phones out of there. This was at a time when calling the U.S., if I wanted to call family in the United States from Europe, I mean, it was prohibitive. It was really, really expensive. And I assume that call, calling the U.K., uh, getting uh, DIDs, we'll talk about that in a minute with the book, uh, getting inward dialing numbers wasn't as easy. Porting numbers, another great subject that was a, either didn't, you couldn't either do it at all or there was no affair. I don't remember. That's that, right. I remember they know. Could you port at all even then? Yeah, you, 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 you couldn't put, certainly couldn't port numbers easily. And to call the US, you'd be paying, what, 20, 20, 25 pence a minute for that. And these days, we mentioned it earlier, calls to the US, effectively, for anybody in, in Europe, are effectively free now. We don't as, want a, them. as a matter of fact, and this is going to lead us to talking to our guest about the book, uh, as a matter of fact, my ISP gives us free unlimited calls to something like a hundred countries, including the U.S., including China, including uh, in the U.S. What's great about the U.S. is it includes mobiles because they don't know the difference between mobiles and others, whereas that's not true. Anyway, Venus, we're going to get started by asking you, what is the genesis? How did this book start? I And then who is it for, of course? But give us a little background on why you did this. In fact, maybe where you're even coming from in technology. Sure. Uh, so everything started like five years ago, and back then, and still, and still now, I was working in a company called Msoft, and we were like software providers. And let's say um, maybe 
30-40% of our clients, they were startups, people who were making first steps in their void business. And I, as I was handling uh, all the inquiries in the company, and by the way, I, I was working um, and I'm still working as a sales manager in the company. Um, and I received many questions like uh, how to start void business, how do I find boy provider, where do I buy DID numbers, and so on. And I was quite curious and I started to dig deeper uh, just to look if there is some source in the internet that answers all those questions. And let's see, after some time of uh, analysis, researches, and so on, um, I released a white paper and it was called How to Start Calling Card Business. So let's say calling cards is just one of many business models that can be based on what technology. Um, then we put this white paper into our website and people started to download it. And for me, it felt like I created some document and maybe it helped people, um, maybe it helped to understand something better and so on and it felt nice and um, I got some additional questions about that and decided just to convert this primary idea of the white paper into let's say more informative uh, guide how to start uh, different uh, business models based on web technology so this is the story behind this uh, my background uh, isn't technological in the company I'm handling the sales but in general in general I'm a curious person and I like reading I like communicating with people so this is how I learned all this stuff and I was I'm just preparing uh, let me hit return so that it gets a little bit more clear just preparing the the uh, URL to go to those of us in the Hangouts see a film strip which is obscuring that, but the recording and the people watching live will see that it says, of course I can't see what it says, but uh, whatever it says, go to that URL and you'll get more information. Uh, so, yeah, okay, so you're not technical as such, which means you had to do a lot of research. How did you, a little bit about how you went about getting all this information, because we're going to get into what information in a second, and got a panel of experts here who poured over this book and have a few comments for you, but how, what did you do to, uh, because you can't just Google a name, uh, a term that you've never heard of, right? You can't, you can't look up things that you don't know about, so what was your methodology? Can we hear just a little bit about that? Yeah, so in general, let's see, in the company, uh, we provide saw switches, so this is like the main element, the central element that connects calls, bill calls, and so on. So. Uh, most of the providers, they have the salt switch and the billing system and sometimes it's, it's all, all in one solution. So let's say I learned a lot of things in the company. So this is first. Uh, second, I learned many things from communi communicating with our clients because some of the clients, they were startups, but other clients, they were experienced web providers with a experience like some of you, right? Um, maybe bigger, maybe lower but it doesn't matter so I learned by communicating by reading I mean there are really a lot of good and useful resources in the internet especially voipinfo.org a great guy that is managing this portal um, reading the books uh, following the news and so on but yeah so th this is how I came with all this okay and did you Feel, how did you feel the need for this book? I mean, obviously, you looked around and there's no book. It reminds me yeah. of the story. There's a story. I won't tell the whole story. It would take about an hour. But um, basically, a man who had no education was fired because he couldn't read. And then he found out he was looking for tobacco. And he couldn't find a tobacco s store on his street. So he opened one. <laughs> uh, it's a Roald Dahl story. Anyway, the man became very rich because he kept getting new locations. Did, you saw that there was no book that would answer all these questions, I guess, is that, I think that's something about what you said. Uh, yeah, correct, um, because like um, when I started to get those questions from entrepreneurs, I started to look if there is some, let's say, the white paper, the resource, and what I found only some simple articles, there was something in the VoIP info, of course, in some websites about uh, VoIP business, 
But if you look to Amazon, and back then there, there were plenty of the books about VoIP as the technology, but there were no book that would explain how to make business using this technology. And I do not tell about the books, uh, how to become millionaire, self-motivation, and something like that. Just a simple book that you need a web provider, you need the DID, you need the server, you need the salt switch, you need to find clients, suppliers, and, and everything. So yeah, it felt, let's say, there is a niche, of course, in, in the world there are not a lot of startups, so it's very, very niche community. Um, but it felt interesting to write something that does not exist in the market yet, even though, let's say, demand may be very small. Right. You know, there's a joke in the wine business, which is how to make a fortune in the, how to make a fortune in the, how to make a big fortune in the wine business. How? Oh. Uh, no, how to, I'm sorry, I, yeah, I told the joke poorly, there it is. How to make a small fortune in the wine business. How? Start with a big fortune. All right, moving on. Since I messed the joke up, I just want to show the uh, table of contents. Let me see if I can do this quickly. There we go, presenting to everyone. Um, I can't, yeah, this should be good. Contents, understanding, take a quick review of this. There's a little bit about the history, right, and understanding a general part. There's some things about quality. There's uh, some technical stuff about the voice over IP, what it is security benefits, telephone numbers, regulation, geographical. Obviously, we can't cover all of this, but I'm showing a little bit about what's in it. And by the way, this is a draft copy that I have, so there may be changes. I, I want to tell people that this is, may not be exact. Resellers versus providers, APIs, CDR. Etc. CDR is the record, the way you um, do billing and so on. We can kill that now. Um, so, where would you like to start as far as, you know, how would somebody proceed? They have the book, which, by the way, when is the book going to be out? You told me it's not quite ready, not out yeah. yet. So, um, I expect it to be finished on March. So, as, as, as I, I told you earlier, I was running the Kickstarter campaign to finance this book. Um, I received the needed financing and first people to receive this book will be the backers of this campaign and later on after that uh, maybe on April or, or May I will just put it um, in the Amazon. And is it is it print, is it uh, ebook only, is it print only or is it both? Both. Okay, you're planning on doing both. Excellent. Yeah. It's worth mentioning that you had, you went way over what you asked for with your Kickstarter, correct? You, you had a modest uh, um, target amount. Uh, yeah, basically, um, I calculated that I will need um, maybe $5,000 or something like that. Uh, then I decided to raise a bit lower budget because Kickstarter is, as you know or not, uh, it's all or nothing. So I thought, okay, maybe it will be better just to lower the goal so I would reach it, and then I will put some of my own money. But... Um, I made, let's say, the goal like uh, in United States dollars like um, three, maybe three and a half thousand, and I made it in five days. And uh, it was just 20% of the time. And I thought, okay, I still have a plenty of the time. What can we do out of this? So by the end of the campaign, I managed to more than double uh, the initial goal. So it was quite successful. Yeah, that, that's absolutely amazing. There's a couple of interesting things that you mentioned in the intro. I'm looking at it now. And um, one of them is, and it's true. I mean, if you're looking for home service, every one of us on this panel has probably gotten this question a million times. Yeah, I'm tired. I don't want the copper pair anymore. I want VoIP service. It's cheaper. It's whatever, more flexible, etc. cetera. Um, and it's very hard to understand all these things. And in this book, you have a, a section called Choosing a VoIP Service, and it talks about residential VoIP, mobile VoIP, callback, calling cards. I don't know how, by the way, I don't know how um, important calling cards are these days and callback, but I had a callback years and years ago. When it, was, when it cost millions to call the states, uh, we had a, a number you'd call, and then it would give you a dial tone and you would call out. Anyway, unified communications, SIP trunking. It's true that these, this is a good thing, these concepts... 
are not obvious to the average person, even uh, technologically speaking, unless uh, that person has had experience with with us with VoIP or with telephony anyway. So soft with soft which soft switch selection, finding partners and suppliers, launching the service and so on. Okay, so how can we give an overview of this? I mean that's my overview is that's in the intro. There's some history of telephony. When does that start? Um so, do you want me just to give the short intro about the book, or well, the history you of you? You actually have a little section on this. Is actually, pretty interesting. The the communication of point to point and voice transmitted over analog signals. When was that? What 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 point in history does your history start? Is I guess what I'm saying. Ah, okay. Uh, so, in general, I give I give this small piece of information about the history. Just um, let's see if the person who is completely new in VoIP, you should explain the big picture for this person. What is what is communication, what types of networks there are, and so on. So let's say in the beginning I just shortly reviewed the evolvement uh, of communication, starting from maybe switchboards, where there were uh, switchboard operators who were manually connecting the calls. And now all this is automated, so let's say th this was the starting point, but I just wanted to go through all those things very fast because people are maybe not interested in the history, they are interested in what they can do now. No, no, I think it's, I think it's interesting and um, it may be worth mentioning, even though I talk too much, that I can recall I was a little boy and my parents left me at somebody's house and you picked, I picked up the, the phone didn't have a dial on it and I picked up the phone and someone said, number please. That was the United States. So, I mean, that's going back to the probably the 1950s. <laughs> yeah, and as I see, James is showing another type of the phone, right? <laughs> With his hands. Yeah, I'm a... James, your, your audio just cut off for some reason. I don't know, I don't know why, because you're not muted. Unless I'm the only one. Are you hearing, is anybody hearing him? No, no, no. I'm now not right. muted. There we are. There you are. Uh, yeah, I would have thought. I would have expected you to have to wind the little handle. In no, this was a. This looked. This looked point. exactly like a dial phone, but it had no dial, and um, you know, it had. The, it was a standard model. But anyway, no, it wasn't the crank. Who? who anybody else on the panel remember? So everybody remembers rotary dial, right? Oh yes. Yeah, even I had that. <laughs> yeah, none of you are young enough. To be. Um, before rotary dial, well, I can remember my mother used to know the codes to tell the long distance operator to make the call route faster. Isn't that funny? She had a thing that she would tell the operator when she wanted to call her sister. Anyway, so we moved from there to, to traditional networks, PSTN, which everybody uh, who's listening to this would know. Um, I don't know, where, where should we go from here? How do, we, how do you want to zoom through this book? We've got about 40 minutes left. What's the best way to cover this now? Uh, yeah, so basically, let's say um, about this book, I have changed the structure of the, books li of the book like uh, 50 times, I think. And um, in general, I spent five years to write this book, and in, in this world, it does not make sense to write the book for five years because <laughs> things change faster than I'm writing. But anyway, um, so... The reason is just to uh, put everything in the right sequence. So I'm thinking that if there is the person who is new in this business, or let's say a person who is curious to know what's behind VoIP, so I put it into this section. First of all, I explain about the telecommunications in general, let's say the short his history, what I've what types of telecommunication networks are there, let's say the mobile network, right, the, that we all know, the uh, PSTN or let's say POTS network, the VoIP, and how the VoIP is different, okay? So when you understand how VoIP is different, you need to understand what is the value of uh, the VoIP for the end user. And uh, when a person understands what's the value for the end user or let's say for the business user, um, 
then he, let's say, can understand um, how to do the business by creating this value. And now, uh, let's see, the next se uh, section after you understand um, uh, the, con the main concepts of telephony is, um, I think, choosing the service. Because a lot of people, when I uh, s speak with others, and let's say I tell VoIP, uh, for most of people in maybe my generation, it sounds like uh, Skype or Viber. And when they think about what, they only think, uh, okay, so why should I use some small provider when there is a Skype or Viber? Uh, other people, I don't know, maybe like James, um, thinks about maybe business services uh, when we talk about VoIP. And, but actually there are, let's say, like uh, in, in my book, I list around 10 different business models based on VoIP technology. It does not mean that uh, each of those business models or services is what will make you rich or what's trending and so on. I'll just, let's say, those business models that exist, uh, in some countries they work, in some countries they don't work. Let's say, Randy, you told about the callback. No one is using that in the U.S., but they are using the service in those countries, in, let's say, third world countries. Uh, third world countries where DIDs are not available and you need to somehow make lo long distance calls at a cheaper rate. Uh, so yeah, so that's about the services and what's also interesting, what most of us are not aware of is let's say VoIP GSM termination or great termination. So there are people, let's say simple people who are deploying those VoIP GSM gateways and they are bypassing mobile operators and making profit out of that, and it's also a great business. <laughs> you don't need a provider, you buy the SIM cards, you terminate the calls through the SIM cards. Um, and I actually, uh, two, two years ago, I was in Moscow, and I met um, uh, one of my clients there, and he was doing, back then he was doing uh, WebGSM termination in Russia, I hope authorities do not listen to <laughs> this conference. Uh, so um, he was doing this uh, WebGSM termination in Russia, and in two years, um, he managed to uh, make enough profit to buy the apartment in Moscow. And that's really, really good. And of course, now you cannot do this any longer. Uh, but let's see, there are different opportunities. It depends on the market. So let's see, services, they explain you what services are available, and then it is up to you to decide what works and what doesn't work in your market. Uh, then, um, deciding on the business model, so what I mean by that is that, let's say, roughly there is, there are two levels, provider and reseller. Reseller um, is a company that, or, or a person or organization that um, doesn't have its own infrastructure, uh, they, let's say, find some provider in their market that has quite good brand, has good rates and so on, and they become like their sales uh, partner, and they resell their services. They do not need to invest anything unless maybe they work in prepayment, and it's very good um, uh, way to uh, get into this business if you are completely new in this business, if you do not know anything about the technology, but you want to get this started. So let's say this is one of the ways to start. And usually when resellers, they become more advanced, when they create a group of users, uh, then they start to think, okay, so I have this provider. This provider doesn't allow to offer this or this service, or maybe their rates are too high, or maybe I just do not have enough control on my business. Then they start to think that they should um, create um, uh, they should become a service provider to invest in their own infrastructure and so on. So this is, let's say, another level. And uh, quite often uh, when people approach me, they tell, okay, I want to become a service provider. But when we start um, to communicate a bit deeper, I see that they have absolutely no knowledge. So this means that most probably they would lose their investment very fast and they would get bankrupted in months. Uh, so this is why it's maybe important to begin maybe with this 
smaller step and move on once you get experience. So that's about, um, let's say, deciding on the business model. Uh, then there is a salt switch selection. Uh, let's say I consider salt switch as the core platform for a small provider, but by a salt switch I mean the platform which handles the switching, uh, call routing, and billing. Okay, so let's see, I explained the differences between class four and class five salt switch, what uh, features they include, what's needed for each service, and so on. Um, and then after that, uh, just let me uh, think, after a salt switch selection, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Uh, I, I was writing the book, but I do not remember. The <laughs> okay, table well, one comment, and I think everybody's sure. uh, thinking this at the same time, is that the um, uh, the cost per minute has gone down to the point where it's almost zero. So reselling minutes is not much of a business. However, and you you mentioned this in your um, in your intro, uh, I don't know what page I'm on here, but value-added service. Anyway, the, the name of the game today is imagining new services. So assuming someone uh, using your book, assuming someone started a business by understanding all these different elements of it, they really could think to themselves, well, you know what? I could provide, uh, I'm just going to say, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, I've got a, you know, butcher shops, some vertical market that the person knows. And I know that butcher shops always call at 9 a.m. to the wholesaler to see what meat he has. Whatever, whatever that is, it doesn't even matter. But whatever it is, that can, the process can be automated or made quicker or made easier. Or a dentist's office that wants to make automatic, automated calls, robocalls, but not robocalls, the irritating advertising kind. The kind that say, I'd like to remind you that you have an appointment in a week. If you want to cancel it, now's the time, for example. And th there are many, many examples of this already. Uh, th there's also a lot of work going on with debt collection. Now, all of this would start with a switch like Asterisk, like Free Switch, like Camellio, and you would build the logic behind it. But you still would need to know how to connect to VoIP and things like routing the calls to get the least cost so that uh, you can offer somebody this service. Anyway, I just want to interject that, and I'm going to call for other people to intervene because I know James is rubbing his chin, and he may have something to say. I know. I'm sitting here um, making notes, just flicking through the book. There's a lot of stuff in here. It's such a wonderfully broad subject. So, so I just before we get into the back into the voice. Yeah, not before I dive in. One thing that tweaked my interest very early on, which is about the Kickstarter. Um, how did you get on with? How, how did you meet the requirement that they they say you should have a working prototype before you can do start a Kickstarter? What what's the equivalent of a working prototype for a book? A draft book. Um, working prototype. I have never heard about it. <laughs> when so I so I'm, to I, I, I'm told that Kickstarter want that. Expect they have go. You go through some process, which you're expected to show that it's reasonably possible that you might deliver. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering what the equivalent was for a book. Yeah. So basically, um, I don't know when you read the this uh, about this working project, or maybe it's uh, more applicable for the things. What's right. what's physical? Right. Uh, in my case, there were absolutely no requirements to show some working prototype. Uh, what I needed to do just to write the description of this project, to record the video uh, where I explain about the idea of this project, and to create the re reworks. And what was, aside of that, what was the most difficult for me is that Kickstarter does not allow creating campaigns for Lithuanians, okay? And I'm Lithuanian. And maybe for Kickstarter, it's just a too small country, and they are not interested in it yet. So what was more difficult for me is to find a partner uh, who will be, uh, let's see, register... Uh, on whose name uh, this campaign will be registered. So right. for me, that was the bigger challenge. Interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you. So you've, you've had your bit now, have you? Yes, I'll shut up now, James. That's all right, too. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't let anybody else get away with it, mine. 
Um, but anyway, um, but yes, uh, it kind of occurs to me that um, your book is focused very firmly on kind of the traditional SIP VoIP type model. What's interesting is that I can't think of anybody, well, I can think of a few people who made a bit of money, but I can't think of anybody who's made a lot of money out of SIP VoIP uh, as a service provider. Um, lots of people invested a lot of money in things like Vonage, uh, uh, but very few people have actually made money out of it. Um, and I have, I have a happy memory from many, many years ago of being in a, in a smoke-filled room with a much younger Niklas Zenström and, uh, and a colleague who I won't name because he now runs one of the biggest uh, SIP VoIP operations in UK. And uh, this particular person was poking poor old Nicholas in the chest, saying, like, hey, Nicholas, the future is going to be SIP VoIP. Your funny little proprietary protocol, uh, your Skype thing, it's never going to catch on uh, because it's proprietary and open standard voice over IP is the only way forward. Um, he's done all right. I think he's probably just about a millionaire now because he's built his, his safe SIP VoIP business up in lots of effort over, over the last 10, 15 years. But um, I'm just thinking that Niklas Zenström um, and his team from the Baltic States have done considerably better. Um, so what am I trying to say here? Um, perhaps the biggest opportunities are not in doing the same thing as everything else, everybody else, but trying to work out what the new angles are and how you come up with something new which makes you unique and you can make money out of it. And yeah, and yeah, you can make money out of SIP VoIP, but you're never going to make a huge amount of money, I don't think. What do you, what do you think, Phileas? Um, yeah, so regarding, uh, like you told, uh, creating something from a different angle, um, I don't know, maybe now it's hard to reinvent the wheel, right? It's hard to create another Skype or something like that, um, and especially not for the audience that I'm writing. Okay. Um, and I completely agree that you will make millions. Um, maybe you will earn more than you could earn, let's say, in the, the average salary. It, it depends. But um, maybe what I would like to emphasize is that um, the revenue and the profit, it does not uh, depend maybe on how unique our business uh, will be. Because what I found out, um, during those years, um, I've been working. Um, I've spoken with like uh, thousands of uh, established web providers and as well as startups. And what what I noticed uh, between uh, what was connecting those successful ones that first of all, all of them came to business with the experience. They knew absolutely what they were doing. Uh, they had previous experience. Let's say they were working in a telco and they knew all the processes. Most of them already had the clients, okay? Second thing, uh, they, aside of experience, they already had the people who were, let's say, waiting with the money in their hands just to pay for the service. So they already had the target audience, and this target audience can be uh, not, let's say, the broad mass, uh, but something specific, like Randy gave an example, some gro grocery shop or some uh, real estate agencies or, I don't know, some ethnic community, right? Some people, let's say you are, uh, you belong to some ethnic community or you belong to some organization or you worked in some business uh, with the real estate agencies. So basically you have the access to the target audience. So I would say that experience, access to the target audience, those are the two most important things, at least from my experience. I don't know. What about you, James? What do you think? Well, that sounds, sounds about right. Um, I think the real opportunity these days is not so much in just the basic service, because uh, basic VoIP now is a commodity, and it costs next to nothing. You, you can't make any margin on it, because the margins are so slender. But where you can make money is in doing the, the value-added applications and services that go with it. Um, and we participate, I mean, this group, we, we participate fully in the 
uh, in the TAD community, the Telecoms Application Developer community. That's where you take basic building blocks like SIP VoIP and you bolt SIP VoIP in with other uh, bits and pieces to build an application. And Tim is one of the, the experts in this area. I'm going to do something annoying, James, and disagree with you. I think there are still places oh, in the well, world that, where... There's a first, Tim. Yeah, I know, I know. I, know. Um, I think there are still places in the world where there are um, um, uh, margins still to be had. And, 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 and it depends a bit on your ambition. If you're trying to run a, make enough money to run a, you know, 800-person company with offices in central London and all that, then, yes, you need quite a lot of money. But, I mean, I was told this story... A um, friend of mine was was building this app, which was going to do some minor little arbitrage about um, between two different rates from a carrier. And he, you know, he was aiming. Uh, I was have... waiting for you to, to get round to the island of Newey. No, 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 uh, actually not. Happened. So he was saying that he was doing this minor arbitrage around Deutsche Telekom's rates for mobile routing. So he he had this route which he could you know trim a. A few cents off off a off a Dutch telecom thing, and he and he basically had this app that people used, and um, and I said, but you know, surely if you get at all successful, Dutch telecom will just close that hole in their rate, rate table, and it, it won't happen. He said, the thing is that for them to notice that and to be bothered to rewrite their rate table, I have to be turning over enough business for them to notice me, and in order to turn over enough business to 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 notice me. I've made enough money. By the time I've done that, I've made enough money that I'll never have to work again. You know, it's only so a couple of million to him was enough to stop working, but a couple of million to Deutsche Telekom wasn't worth working their lawyers up for. You know, so it's uh, it, there is still. I think if you're if you're still in the if you're looking at carefully at, particularly in in less so in Europe because it's tending to flatten out that, but but it, there is there are still places where you know. As you say, and there are islands where it costs you a dollar a minute, and anything you can route around that um, is is it's profit. Very true, but the amount of traffic that goes to those places is tiny. Well, hence the ambition. If you want to run a two-person shop and buy yourself an apartment out of it, then there's still money to be made out of that level of money. But if you want to run an 800-person company in the centre of London with a and the rest of it, then no, there probably isn't that that level of money to be extracted. Yeah. And I think that generally speaking, the the widespread availability of cheap cellular telephone telephony now is kind of killing off VoIP to a certain extent. What would you, what do you think? I suspect it's moving it to a different place because now you've got mobile VoIP players doing over the top plays, and they they range in scale from tiny to massive. So the the field has changed, maybe. Yeah, but there are still areas of opportunity, like um, the machine-to-person type field, which you just can't do easily using things like um, um, FaceTime and um, Google, Google Voice, that sort of stuff, and BBM. Um, so you still have to use SIP VoIP and PSDN to, to do the, the machine-to-person stuff. And a similar sort of thing with, with SMS messaging. D uh, Vilius, I didn't see, did you mention SMS um, in, in your VoIP book at all? Not really, not really. Okay, because that's kind of part and parcel of running a, a VoIP service these days. Most people well, SMS do... has certainly been a significant chunk of revenue historically, although one wonders if that's going to continue or if that's in decline. It's all. Well, Phyllis does mention, of, of course, unified communications. So you, the, the the messaging side of it is in there in the in the book, but not um, from a mobile perspective, purely from a unified communications perspective. Yeah, I mentioned unified communications, but let's say it's a quite tiny part because it's just too hard. Uh, of course, there are many, many different technologies based on VoIP and related with VoIP, but it's impossible to cover everything. So I would say that it's j just the basics, right? If a person is interested particularly in specific technology, then he can get deeper by... Um, Maybe, I don't know, by reading another book. No, you're very, very correct when you say that there just aren't any books about running VoIP businesses, because there aren't. 
Yeah. Oh, by the way, it's uh, interesting, um, James, that um, when I started to write uh, the book, there were no books. Then this year, I started to Google a bit. Uh, I went to Amazon and I noticed <laughs> one book. It was uh, how to start a wholesale business. Um, for some reason, I did not find anything about this author. I think he was from Nigeria. Uh, <laughs> but this book uh, was 17 pages length. So I don't know if you can call this book, but there is, let's say, something. So this was one of the books that I found about Wipe. And another book um, was um, also about something um, related with the mobile VoIP. Um, I also contacted the author. I tried to speak with him. But when I opened the table of contents, I noticed that this book is um, its like um, how you can become a client or reseller of this company. And um, I don't know. Maybe that's the way to begin the business, but... Um, not, not, let's say it's the different angle of the book. It's clear was the goal of this book. And in my case, I want just to make this book completely independent. It uh, doesn't emphasize which provider you should use, which hardware you should choose, and so on. It gives, let's say, the many different examples. So the client could choose by himself, but he will not get the real instructions. Use this S risk or free switch or Zoiper. <laughs> yeah, so he will get the basic understanding, yeah, but later on his choice. What business he will do, what scale he will do. And by the way, Tim, you explained very good about uh, the, the essence of the business is that some people are thinking that business is like becoming a millionaire, right? And in my case, I try to touch it to those people who want to do small business. Most of, let's say, my clients, they are one, two-man companies, and they are quite successful by running small-scale business. Maybe they will never have the office in London with 800 employees, but it depends on the ambitions of the people. Yeah, I think there's quite, definitely some really... I'm sorry, James. Yeah, you're quite right. And, and quite often, VoIP is a really valuable component in a bigger place. So you might have a small ITSP, sorry, I ISP, who... Uh, the way they differentiate is by providing a complete uh, wrap of services, which includes VoIP. And so that's exactly where I was going with this, James. Uh, and and he's. I see that I'm on. Where are the page numbers here? Just a second. I'm on page 57 of. This is a draft uh, item, but just so that those of you who have it. Um, and there's a, a heading on premise versus hosted. Now this is a discussion that we've actually had a couple of times on the VUC because it's a really important thing for a lot of people to know about, uh, especially with uh, you know every other word on, on web pages of companies now is cloud. So you know it's either cloud or 365. You, between if there is a company that doesn't have one of those words, uh, I, they probably have been around for 20 years or more. Anyway. Um, the discussion about on-premise PBX versus uh, hosted or yeah. cloud-based. Yeah. In, in, in my cloud. eyes, there's, uh, there's no competition because uh, the cloud-based hosting wins every time. And in fact, if you're smart, you can play games like you, you can find some free cloud-based hosting in one place and you can find some free inbound numbers from another place right. and free outbound calling from another place, you mash them all together and you get a completely free uh, VoIP system. Um, and if you then put a couple of layers of that on top of each other, the thing becomes very robust and resilient. And it's all free. You don't have to pay a well, that, that's But that's, there, there's also a significant difference there in, in uh, as it Dave Michaels and I have been through this a couple of times and he's come around eventually. <laughs> um, cloud versus hosted. And Cloud and hosted are not the same um, because hosted could be deterministic about where the hardware is, where cloud could be you know, geographically diverse and resilient and all of that, whereas uh, a cheap hosted system could be as bad as having your own in-house PBX. You just offloaded the responsibility to some other schmo. Yeah, of course you're right. Um, I... As much as I've looked through the book, I think this is a really an excellent intro. I, I don't know about business because I'm not interested in going into the business, but I just think that when I first started, even as a hobbyist and looking at asterisk and everything, 
uh, this book is worth 10,000 hours of hanging out on IRC and asking questions, although nothing replaces that either because <laughs> Brian West <laughs> is not in this book, but uh, besides that. He is. Brian West is mentioned in the book. I'm sure he's actually mentioned, but he's not there live going, next, <laughs> like he did on IRC. Um, anyway, there's, there's, this is great. Now, I know that there's a few... A lot of these guys have looked through the book and they may have a few connect corrections or additions. Well, I'd like to add. In fact, yeah. this makes me want to write a little uh, web blog post um, listing probably the 10 things I would like to have known early on when starting yeah. a VoIP business. So it's little things like um, how you can improve your service just by adhering to the ITF recommendations for diff serve tagging um, and all of a sudden as soon as you get your diff serve tags right on your VoIP um, you find that it works so much better for example it doesn't cost you a penny it's just a, a configuration thing um, I'd like to know um, yeah, more about manipulation of um, codecs in particular transcoding um, how to avoid a lot of the nastiness transcoding distortion you get uh, between certain codecs and certain codecs ought to be put down at birth and never ever used um, because they're just so nasty and other codecs like our favorite codec uh, Opus you haven't even mentioned in the book yet and so um, you I think we can probably write you a list of things um, for you to add to, to, to the final draft and Andy's got a whole load I can see Bouncing up and down with enthusiasm there. Yeah, Vilus, is it too late to add uh, some ideas? We want to add a whole load to your book. Or is it over? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so basically now I'm in the stage of editing. Um, I, I wouldn't say I, I am editing. There is a person in specific time who is editing the book. So I, I would say that more or less I will leave it as it is. But um, maybe we can write another book together with you guys. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's always volume a, two. Yeah, volume two. Well, or it's just second edition, indeed. I mean, there, there are, as you said earlier, things move so fast that it's it's almost impossible for you to keep up with all this. So um, a, a second edition is is always a good plan. Well, it's, or an online community, right? An online indeed. community of, of, of people. Well, so my, my wife wrote a book, and uh, she also opened a blog by the same name. And that well, a lot of people have done this, by the way. And then that way you've got the book comes out, and you've got the blog, and then you add things to it, and then you do a second edition based on all of the input and the things that you may have added. So, well, we'll keep in touch on this, and and uh, between James, Andy, and possibly Tim, or possibly me, or possibly Michael, um, we have another half of fifty percent more uh, content for you. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to see what yeah, Tim impression. How's that? Yeah. So maybe one of the mistakes that I have done and I've learned from it is that um, when when I started to write this book, I was doing like. Uh, writing in the garage, uh, let's say I will use this term, because I was closed outside the world, I was writing each day for a few hours, searching for the information, but I didn't do something that I encourage others to do now, create a minimal available product, and then just improve it, like you tell, uh, write the blog post, see the people's reaction, what they like, what they don't like, and so on. So, of course, if I would do everything now, I would do completely differently, because when I started to talk about this book, I met really nice and uh, um, intelligent guys that know much more than me and have uh, better experience, and uh, even, let's say, now I got uh, suggestions to... Uh, from other people uh, who released like few telecom books to be a co-author of this book and let's say apply it to the American um, audience. I received a suggestion from one of the tier two Australian provider. Uh, they also want to participate and adapt this book for Australia. 
then uh, there is a person uh, maybe who is listening to this uh, podcast now um, uh, from the Netherlands. He will be also translating this book and maybe adapting it for the Netherlands market. So, of course, it's uh, <laughs> really nice to meet uh, other people who are, let's say, similar-minded. But again, it takes time just to create all this, to put together, and so on. A big work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you've done a brilliant job, Ilias, I have to say. Thank you. Um, I think it's a fantastic uh, intro. The really clever bit is recognizing that nobody else has written a book like this before. That's the clever bit. Um, Anybody else have comments or questions? Go on, Andy. You've got a whole load of comments because you were bouncing up and down going, oh, I need to tell Vilius this. No, 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 no. no. The, the, these are minor editing things, really. It, o overall, I think the, the, the whole flow of the thing uh, c comes together very well. Um, I mean, clearly I've not managed to read it all the way through, but uh, we, we've, uh, a couple of us have had a, a, a good skim read through, if you can ever have a, a, such a thing as a good skim read. And it certainly... Um, comes together well. If, if I wanted to, to make one comment, I think I would really try and push push the potential fraud aspect harder. Yeah, it's the one thing that will kill small businesses faster than anything else is is the the huge amount of money you can lose through telecoms fraud very quickly. And if you if if you don't have a very robust anti fraud system, then you will die. There's no two ways about it. So, yeah, pe people, uh, maybe maybe a bit about making sure that whoever, uh, whatever systems that uh, you you end up using, are penetration tested by somebody. It, so if you're using a hosted system and you're relying on them um, to do all the uh, the control and or fraud management, if you if you like to put it that way, uh, so that people really need to ask them the awkward questions. How many how many times have you been hacked? How much money have you lost? Have you penetrated had penetration testing on all your systems? Yeah, you need to unleash somebody from country code nine seven three. Can be <laughs> lots of different. Areas, yeah, um, loose on your system, and uh, that'll soon uh, show you. Well, it, it, if you don't, they'll turn up of their own accord and and do you anyway. So, you know, it's best to uh, to have done that under controlled circumstances. And I mean, I think think the only ad ad piece I'd add to the the fraud aspect is is the relationship. I mean, I haven't read the book, so I, this may be covered, but but is the a relationship with your suppliers is is putting a limit, for example, on um, on how much money you can run up, a, how many how much debt you can run up over a weekend, and making sure that they'll honour that that kind of stuff, so that you know you can cap your losses, um, and that's to do with negotiating with your suppliers and coming up with deals with them that that you can live with. Um, I think that's an important element because however hard we try with with fraud protection, there's always the possibility that there's something we didn't know about, um, and that it'll happen anyway. And then you need that last, uh, last catch-all of, of you know, well, the supplier will cut you off when you've run up a bill of five thousand euros or whatever it is, um, and and you make them promise to do that. And before we went before we went public, we actually mentioned uh, Newphone, which suffered that very thing before they went out of business. They were the hot item. I don't when I don't remember what year that was, but and they weren't the only ones. That had that problem. Does everybody see that photo? Yes, I think that's a. Can I have a copy of that? Isn't that nice? I don't know what he's doing. He looks like Chris Matthew, though, a little bit. No, Not he looks like, but he's no. the gesture. It doesn't look like Chris Matthew. No, the pose, the pose of the magician. Yeah, oh, that, that, that. You know. Right. So, Vilius, uh, I think what you need to do is to prepare yourself ready for the second edition, which you are going to have to write, is that you need to get yourself. Um, well, weekend, weekend after next, over to Paris, and you meet a whole load of people who give you a whole load of stuff. Uh, probably more importantly, you need to get across to Berlin uh, next year for Kama Elia World, because you would be amazed. Everybody who is anybody in the VoIP world is there. So, for example, you mentioned in the book, good old Sip Vicious. We had the guy who wrote Sip Vicious. 
doing uh, doing one of our dangerous demos for for us. In fact, probably the most dangerous thing was admitting uh, in that audience that he wrote Sip Vicious because it's yeah well known in certain circles. Yeah, um, it's, but, it's another another good um, way to do the business. From we spoke a lot about VoIP fraud, right? And um, let's see, Sip Vicious. It is one of the tools that is used for VoIP hacking, right? It is indeed, yeah. In fact, perhaps your next book should be uh, How to Hack People Who Haven't Protected Themselves Properly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That note. <laughs> and that well, note. Well, we know a number uh, of people who've got a, a certain amount of experience uh, in that area. I mean, there's really interesting people lurking around, like uh, Alexander Doobie Scooby Dooby Doobikov, uh, who's responsible for Homer, for example. He did uh, an absolutely brilliant tutorial on um, all kinds of attack vectors at Camera Elio World last year, and it was it was brilliant. And I, I, I think you can probably find the video, and you could virtually write a book about um, VoIP attack based on on that talk that Alexander and um, near not near. Lorenzo. Italian, Lorenzo, Italian beard, home, right. yeah, uh, gave in Berlin. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, Did you see the live session at what was it in Astrakhan, I think, with Nir and maybe Eric or I can't remember who it was, where they used that the search engine that can look into IPs. Yes, you all know what that is. I can't remember. Yeah, and that's very true. You need to need to. In fact, we ought to have Nir and. Uh, and um, Eric, Eric, I've, I've and been J.R. Richardson. I've been eating, Richardson, right? Eating uh, Star Mix again, which is why I can't remember. All right. Well, you're making too much noise with those candy wrappers, James. Anyway, we're just about ready to call it quits here. So, do I have my? Yes, I've got my little uh, URL there where you can look into it. I think this is fantastic intro, though. Uh, business, I don't know, but for an intro to the VoIP technology, if I would have had this book. I would have saved 10,000 hours on IRC talking to Brian K. West and a bunch of other people. <laughs> However, of course, I wouldn't have had the personal experience of talking to Brian K. West and a bunch of other people and having him yell next every time you typed a line. So, Vidus, thank you for joining us. We will hopefully be in touch with you, and maybe we can help you with a an updated edition or at least uh, keep in touch as far as how things are going and maybe when the book gets published you'll let us do a giveaway or a a deal maybe to get a reduced price for people who listen of course of course definitely and also thanks Randy for inviting me uh, of course uh, when we talk about uh, the possibility to add something to the book uh, most probably we are a bit too late but it would be great um, I could send you guys the manuscript so you could like we told scan through the text okay because just before uh, sending uh, after I will finish editing because the editor she doesn't know anything about VoIP and it would be interesting just to get some feedback from you guys as you have experience just to give some quick notes if you see that there are some mistakes because anyway English is my second language so it would be really great to get some feedback so for sure I will send the manuscript, updated manuscript for Randy so he could share with you. Okay, excellent. We look forward to volume two or whatever else you're going to do. <laughs> Let's wait for the volume one for first. <laughs> yeah, and we'll look forward to it, and we'll definitely uh, mention it when it comes out. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, and thanks everybody who participated. Of course, now we're going to the mature audiences only version.